everyone and thank you so trying to start now so I'll be on time with my slides uh, so I'm going to give you an overview of clinical investigators responsibilities and inspectional findings uh, let's uh, move on with our objectives so I'm going to start with um, a um, general description of what BIMO program in the uh, Center for Drug Evaluation and Research is, and uh, followed by a, uh, some a summary of how an inspection process looks like, uh, with focusing on clinical investigator inspections. Um, and after that, uh, we'll discuss uh, of the very uh, like important responsibilities and highlights of clinical investigators uh, regulatory requirements, as well as uh, giving you some examples of the most common regulatory violations uh, that we can find during our inspections. Uh, and at the end, uh, hopefully I can give you some tips uh, to improve the conduct of clinical investigations. So let's start with the BIMO program. It is a, um, um, an extensive comprehensive program that covers uh, several areas um, uh, under the FDA regulated research. Uh, however, in the uh, Good Clinical Practice GCP program, uh, we focus on uh, ensuring that the data that are generated from clinical investigations are reliable uh, and the subjects, um, it's frozen. The focus of the program is to ensure that data are reliable and subjects uh, in the, who participate in clinical investigations are um, their rights, uh, safety, and welfare are protected, as well as ensuring that FDA regulated research is in compliance with the applicable regulations. Um, so under the GCP compliance program, uh, we have all these several uh, areas. Uh, however, I will focus on um, the, the GCP section and then narrow it down on the clinical investigator inspections. Um, so the GCP includes sponsored monitors, CROs or contract research organizations, clinical investigators, and sponsored investigators. And by definition, sponsors are the entities, as many of you know, who initiate a clinical investigation. And the clinical investigator is the entity who conducts the clinical investigation and takes responsibility uh, during the conduct of the clinical investigator investigation. Uh, and then sponsor investigator, as the name is saying, um, takes both responsibilities. Um, in our 2016 fiscal year, uh, the extent, extent of the clinical investigator inspection have been very high, like it's usually the, the, the largest part of our inspections um, for clinical investigate, investigators. And the sponsors uh, had about 6% of our GCP inspections. Um, within the clinical investigator inspection category, um, most inspections are data audits uh, for the pre-approval marketing applications as well as um, for example, if there's a supplement who our uh, Office of New Drug uh, requires uh, to audit the data, so we do inspection for those type of applications. And a small portion of our inspections are referrals. As I will describe what the referral means later. And then at the end, we do follow-up inspections on um, when, whenever there is a warning letter issued to an inspected entity to uh, assess the compliance after the corrective actions have occurred. So let's uh, have a question here. OK, so into which of these categories do you best fit? Are you a sponsor, clinical investigator, sponsor investigator, um, any other entity? 
for the audience in the room as well. Let me, let's see which one do you belong. Sponsors, clinical investigators, other entities, IRBs, <laughs> okay, <laughs> or sponsor investigators. <laughs> okay, so looks like most of our um, online audience is uh, in the sponsor category. Okay, so this is going to explain how an inspection process is conducted. So uh, an inspection could be triggered either uh, from our Office of New Drug at request by a consult, through a consult, um, or uh, from any other source that comes from an IRB source, a sponsor source, um, any complainant from the study site or any subject into the study, um, and then we assess that complaint or report or consult, and we just make a decision on whether or not an inspection is required. So we issue an inspection assignment. Uh, we have several uh, district offices uh, throughout the U.S. and internationally. Um, they will go to that site and uh, will review the documents of the study. Um, and after the review, depending on whether they find um, any uh, objectionable conditions or uh, significant findings, they will or will not issue a Form 483 uh, that uh, includes all the observations, and um, we will receive a report from the, uh, our district offices, um, and we review all of that uh, material, including um, the uh, documents that they collected from the site uh, in support of the findings, and as well as um, a response from the inspected entity, uh, and then we decide, uh, make a decision on the final classification. Um, whether we issue a post-inspection uh, correspondence on the type of classification will depend on that final decision. Um, so by show of hands for the audience in the room, let's see if you receive a Form 483 after the end of inspection, do you think you're required to respond to the FDA? Who thinks yes? And who thinks no? Okay, so. Uh, you're not required to respond to the Form 483. However, if you respond, please respond within 15 business days so we can review and consider your response in our evaluation. Um, so depending on uh, the content of your response, um, it could make a change in our decision-making process. Uh, if, if your response includes uh, uh, like explanation or reasoning for the observations that are found during the inspection, that, and there is a strong evidence behind it, you're including all the documentation or uh, you're including the corrective actions that you're, start, you're starting or you're planning, you already planned, you already started and implemented, then that might make a change in our decision making. Um, so the final classification of an inspection is uh, when we decide to, um, on the type of the letter that we issue, it could be a no action indicated letter that uh, is issued when uh, there is no um, finding during the inspection and we uh, conclude that uh, the site was in compliance with our regulations, or it could be a voluntary action indicated when their violations uh, are few or um, they have a minimal impact on data uh, integrity, reliability, or on uh, subject safety, right, and welfare. However, if there are significant violations um, that um, uh, seriously impact subject safety uh, or data integrity, uh, we will uh, consider issuing an official action indicated better that um, as you see, in fiscal year 2016, um, most of our inspections uh, resulted in no NAI and um, about 40% uh, VAI, voluntary action indicated, and uh, about 1% uh, OAI, official action indicated. Uh, within the OAI category, 
we have warning letters. Warning letters are, um, uh, we issue the warning letters because we expect the um, inspected entity to come into compliance uh, voluntarily and promptly. And we, um, we, and we issued the warning letter because we uh, concluded that there were significant violations of impact of data integrity and subject safety. Uh, but the pur purpose is to bring the site into compliance. And we expect that that's voluntary. Um, however, uh, FDA, um, it doesn't commit FDA to take an enforcement action. So uh, receiving a warning letter doesn't mean that you are going to have an enforcement action after that. Uh, or uh, a warning letter is not a prerequisite to take an enforcement action. So an enforcement action could be taken without having the preceding warning letter. Um, after the warning letter was issued, uh, we uh, will um, decide on uh, having a follow-up inspection um, to ensure that the uh, violations are not repeated again and to verify the promised corrective actions are implemented adequately and to ensure compliance uh, is sustained at that site. And then we issue you a close-up letter. So let's look at the um, things that could be reviewed during a clinical investigator inspection. The, they include regulatory documents or a study records, anything related to the study. Um, as we uh, had previous talks on Form 1572, that's one of the forms that we look at and the clinical investigators' um, documents uh, and correspondence with the IRB, with the sponsor, um, the protocols, the amendments of the protocol, study, of course, study uh, subject records, uh, source documents, what are the sources? documents, uh, the progress notes, hospital records, electronic medical records, um, and then we compare them to the case report forms or CRFs and make sure those are transcribed accurately onto the case report forms. Um, and let's have another poll question. I'm going to have uh, quite a few poll questions so you don't fall asleep. Uh, for how long um, is a critical investigator required to retain um, the study-related records. What do you think? Two years, four years, ten years, or indefinitely? How about the audience in the room? Two years? Four years? Indefinitely? Ten years? Uh, okay, so it looks like most people say ten years, and then we have two years. All right. Um, for at least two years after um, the application of a marketing, um, uh, the approval has been done, or after two, at least after two years, uh, after when the application was withdrawn or the study was terminated or closed by the sponsor and the FDA was notified, or no application was submitted. So at least two years, remember that number. Um, so let's focus on the Form 1572, uh, which is an agreement between the sponsor and the clinical investigator. That agreement um, is a sponsor requirement. So sponsors are required to obtain the Form 1572 uh, by regulations. However, as for the clinical investigators, a section on Form 1572 is really important. And those, uh, that section includes all the commitments. So by signing Form 1572, a clinical investigator commits to take the responsibility of conducting the clinical study, uh, either personally conduct the study or supervise the conduct of the study. And when you supervise the conduct of, of the study, that means uh, to uh, meet frequently, frequently with your staff, to know what's going on at the site, doesn't mean that you can delegate only and just leave the place and come back after a long time. You need to be um, in communication, a meeting with them, be aware of um, the, the things that are happening at the site, and to uh, report the adverse events um, as required by the investigation plan, uh, by the protocol to the sponsor, and all the unanticipated adverse events to the IRBs, 
as well as uh, train your staff about the obligations that uh, for the tasks that they are de uh, delegated to. So um, uh, another question to wake you up. Uh, when does a Form 1572 need to be completed? Is it every, uh, any time during the study, every, uh, every month, uh, any time a new clinical investigator is selected by the sponsor? Or, uh, yeah, looks like uh, everybody is on the right answer. <laughs> so every time there is a new clinical investigator added to the IND, or a new study uh, is added to the IND, a Form 1572 needs to be uh, uh, submitted to the sponsor. So the remaining of the commitments uh, include uh, a clinical investigator is required to maintain adequate records um, and accurate records and to retain, as I said, for at least two years and um, to um, let the, uh, the FDA staff uh, have access to the records, uh, so make records available for inspection, and to ensure that the IRB, um, an IRB that is in uh, compliance with the uh, FDA regulations, Part 50 and Part 56, uh, has reviewed uh, initially before enrollment of any subject the study, and also it was still uh, during the uh, study uh, reviewing the continuing approval of the study. So uh, the Form 1572 is a very important document that reminds you of your commitments. So another question just for the audience in the room. Uh, do you have to be a physician to conduct a clinical study as a clinical invest investigator? Yes? Who says yes? Oh, everybody knows the answer. That's fantastic. So you don't have to be a physician. Um, uh, but as long as you delegate um, the task to the, uh, to the qualified uh, staff, so for example, if your study requires uh, like a certain certification that the, the person who is conducting it, you can delegate it to your sub-investigators or to, um, like if, if it's a dental study, have a dentist uh, conduct the study who is qualified for that type of study. So, um, so let's uh, uh, imagine a clinical investigator uh, in the center of a polygon and having all of these responsibilities uh, on the sides. Uh, so experience of an IRB review, um, a clinical investigator, before initiates to enroll in a subject, needs to have approval uh, for the study. And uh, the original protocol has to be submitted to the IRB for approval. And then if you make any changes to the study, you need to submit those changes to the IRB before you uh, enroll new subjects into the study or any revisions in the informed consent, any uh, new safety data, any new, um, any type of new information that is included in the informed consent needs to be submitted in a revised version of the informed consent and get the approval from the IRB before you enroll new patients. So as well as reporting all the unanticipated problems um, uh, that put, put the subjects at risk to the IRB. So um, another side of that polygon is having an adequate documentation of informed consent. Uh, that means that uh, the dialogue between the subject and the person who is giving the consent uh, is very important. It should be, first of all, the uh, original and any revisions, as I said, of the informed consent should be approved by, I, by the R IRB that complies with the regulations and should be signed, dated by the subject uh, or subject's uh, legally authorized representative, LAR. Uh, the cons informed consent should be given um, in a language that is understandable to the subject uh, for any type of language uh, you need to have the consent form translated and get the approval from the IRB um, uh, and then make sure the subject understands all the elements that are included in the informed consent. And these are like required elements, basic elements that include uh, risks associated with the study drug or any um, benefits from the study drug, any alternative treatments uh, that the subject can have, um, uh, 
about the confidentiality of the uh, records and the subject uh, identification. So all of these are required to be included in the informed consent document. Um, another side of the polygon um, uh, is to make sure the clinical investigator adheres and follows the investigational plan. Investigational plan, what is it? Includes all the um, sections, different sections of the protocol, uh, the investigator's brochure. So the protocol has several sections, including pre-enrollment uh, criteria, eligibility criteria, including inclusion, exclusion criteria, as well as uh, the study design. Is, is the study blinded? Uh, or does the study require self-administration of the study drug? Or um, is there any change required in the dosage by having certain labs? And uh, is there any requirement re regarding uh, the reporting of the serious adverse events uh, from the protocol? So you need to stick to the protocol. And that's really, really important. Um, and in addition, another uh, responsibility for the clinical investigator is to have adequate documentation of how the study is being conducted. So the, do the, the documentation should follow the Alcoa principle, attributable, accurate, original, contemporaneous, legible, so you can understand one who comes for, to make the data audit, understand what was happening during the conduct of the study, how the data were documented in the source documents as well as in the case report forms where they uh, accurately transcribe into the case report forms um, and uh, uh, contemporaneously as well. So let's look at what ha can happen after our inspections. What are the most common regulatory violations that we find um, uh, during the inspections? The most common ones, of course, is protocol violations. So uh, that's why I emphasize so much on protocol. Uh, and, and then after that, uh, record keeping violation. This is uh, in 2016 within US, uh, the inspections that uh, took place within US, and then as well as the same pattern is seen in international inspections. Um, and within the category of OAI letters, uh, which had significant violations, we still have protocol violations as the highest number of regulatory violations followed by uh, uh, record keeping and drug accountability violations. Um, let's have some examples. I will focus more uh, mainly on protocol violations that are the highest number. So uh, protocol eligibility requires you to exclude subjects who have severe renal insufficiency. But when we go to, on the inspection, we see um, multiple subjects had chronic renal failure, and they were still enrolled into the study. So perhaps the study is excluding the subjects because the drug is a nephrotoxic drug, and uh, it can accumulate uh, in the blood. Uh, that's the reason for why it was excluded. So uh, that uh, puts the subject at significant risk. Um, another example is when the protocol is requiring you to measure the serum creatinine level at screening as well as at randomization um, because to, uh, to have an estimated glomerular filtration rate, for example. Um, however, many subjects received the drug uh, before the serum creatinine level was measured. So that's another safety uh, concern. Um, so then we follow, in the protocol, we have study procedures. So one of the procedures was focusing on uh, gathering the study endpoints and having the subjects uh, who, before the surgery, uh, measuring the pain, the pain level. But the protocol required that the subjects themselves measure their own the pain level. Uh, when we went to the site and we looked at the records, we saw that the study coordinator was measuring the pain. Uh, so what difference do you think it could make? How much? Um, how important it would be in measuring the study endpoints. That could make a big difference. Um, so another one is when the protocol requires you to, uh, to give rescue medications uh, when there is, a, like, uh, for example, hyperglycemia of uh, higher than or equal to 250 milligrams per deciliter. Uh, 
but you didn't give it. And no rescue medication was given to subjects who had a high level of fasting plasma glucose. And that brings up another safety concern. Um, so we'll, let's move on to the second type of regulatory violation, which is uh, inadequate documentation. Um, so we want that the clinical investigator or the delegated staff have the uh, data that was uh, collected during the visits, the study uh, procedures, uh, be completely and accurately transcribed into the case report form. Uh, so the case report forms that are submitted to the sponsor uh, reflecting the exact uh, original data. So when there is discrepancy, that's a record keeping violation. Or when the, the original data and the source documents were obscured and the new data was put on the top of them, uh, that's a significant violation when you are not able to see the original data. Um, so, so when you make a change, make sure the original data are clear and there is a um, date initial and the reason for the change uh, by the subject, who, by, 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 the, by the person who is making the change. Um, so a clinical investigator, if doesn't strategize well the conduct of the clinical study, things may go really wrong. So let's see what are the possible reasons for, um, for compliance. It could be an insufficient training or awareness at the site. So as a clinical investigator, you need to get training yourself as well as educate the other staff um, about their specific uh, tasks and as well as the, about the protocol, different sections of the protocol, and make sure they have a good understanding of what they are delegated to do or designated. Uh, another factor could be over, overlapping responsibilities which um, can happen a lot these days but with multitasking. And a clinical investigator wants to be involved in multiple studies, um, having uh, big studies and enrolling a not numerous number of subjects into the study, as well as a study coordinator who is involved in multiple studies. So uh, precision goes down. Um, if we think about it philosophically, some people think, a lot of things that we do arise from either fear or desire. So uh, either the, the, you want to do more because you want more, uh, or you're afraid of losing your a job. So uh, you can you know, accomplish worse when you uh, are having other um, ambitions or, or, or fear. Um, one important factor also is to misunderstand the regulations. So the regulations are there for you, but it's very, um, maybe sometimes difficult to translate the regulations into simple words and into put them, putting them into action. Uh, so that's why training uh, could help a lot when you need to get um, the details about the regulations. And uh, regulations try to include all little, you know, important stuff, but they don't explain how. So the how should be get you know should should be done by training and education, um, and also another factor is when you delegate the study task to staff who, uh, that are not qualified for the study. Uh, for example, your study team can include uh, a dentist for a lymphoma study, or a podiatrist for a preeclampsia studies, and so on. So just make sure you find the right person. And things may go wrong as a cascade of uh, like a reaction. If you don't supervise the uh, site that you're responsible for, uh, protocol violations can happen, inadequate documentation, falsification, everything can happen. So it's like a chain reaction. Um, uh, so now, uh, these are, I'm going to give you some tips, but I think everybody, it's a common sense, and everybody might know already. Uh, we can improve with some suggestions. Um, you either commit to what you're doing and you try to make changes or don't do it at all. So you, if, you, if you're not feeling that you, you're able to uh, conduct a huge clinical study, uh, you can discontinue from participation or don't initiate the study. Um, or 
if you want to make a change, make a comprehensive plan with all the details, documentations, and SOPs, working instructions, and make sure you're including all the little steps uh, during the conduct of the study for your staff to follow. And um, train your staff about their responsibilities. And uh, have a timeline uh, to complete your creative actions. Um, and then uh, once you have all the documentation and training, implement. Implement your creative action and make sure uh, your implementation is working. Evaluate your implementation. Um, so uh, I think I made it. So uh, in summary, um, I went over uh, BIMO program specifically for the GCP areas in CEDAR. And we talked about some regulatory requirements and common uh, violations that could happen and we find during our inspections uh, and what type of regulatory actions we take. Uh, and then some examples of our uh, regulatory violations as well as some uh, root, ca root cause analysis. Uh, and here we come with the questions. Thank you so much. All right, and as per usual, if you have questions in the room, feel free to step up to this microphone here, or I can bring a microphone around while we're figuring out our questions in the room. Let's go ahead and start with our first online question, please. As a sponsor, if we use the 1572 to update the IND, do we have to submit a revised 1572 whenever there is a change in sub-investigator? That's a good question. Um, for changing, if the sub-investigator sub is um, having a direct uh, uh, involvement in the conduct of the study, the sub-investigator, uh, if there is a new sub-investigator, that has to be listed under the uh, one section in the form for 1572. Uh, however, um, for a clinical investigator, the clinical investigator doesn't need to uh, update the 1572 every time a sub-investigator is added. Uh, however, for the sponsor, uh, uh, I am assuming that, yes, the sponsor needs to include the sub-investigator and provide FDA, but um, uh, with the new information, yes. Did I answer the question? We're, since it was on a line question? It's yes. Online. Yes, yes, thank you. <laughs> Any questions in the room? Just hold up your hand. I can bring the microphone around. Let's go ahead and get our next online question, please. Is there any requirement to submit Form 1572 again at the end of the study or annually? Annually, you said? Um, no, there is no requirement to submit a 1572 on a regular basis. However, you need to, as I said in the question, Whenever uh, there is a new investigator added to the um, uh, IND or a new study being conducted under that, that same IND, yes, update your 1572. Okay, another online question, please. Can you explain the requirement for the sponsor to collect a 1572 for international sites? So uh, these are all sponsor questions, but I'm OK. I, I can answer that. Um, so sponsors uh, at international sites, yes, if there is, if the study is being conducted under an IND, uh, so all of the IND requirements uh, would work for that type of study. So we do need, you do need to submit a 1572. However, if the study is not conducted under an IND, uh, that's a different thing. Next online question, please. What happens if the 483 response is sent later than 15 days after the closed inspection and the issuance of the form FDA 483? Okay, so as I said, you don't have to respond to the form 483. And if you respond within 15 working days, we will consider your response. Um, in our evaluation of the type of the letter uh, post-inspection or correspondence. However, if it's later than 15, 15 business days, 
We will review it, but we don't take it into consideration for our decision-making process. Keep them coming. Are clinical investigators at international clinical sites required to sign Form 1572? I think it's the same question that I just answered, but in a different uh, format. So yes, uh, if it's an IND study, uh, 1572 requirements apply. Okay. What are the options for a clinical investigator once she receives a notice of initiation of a disqualification proceeding and opportunity to explain? Okay, so once you, so the, the other name for this is a NITPO. So the NITPO letter is an uh, initiation of a disqualification process. And uh, once you receive a NITPO, um, you can respond to the NITPO and provide reasoning, uh, or you can um, ask for an informal conference. Uh, then you can come to the FDA and discuss in a meeting with the FDA um, and bring your uh, evidence or anything that you have to talk about um, for our decision making uh, for the next step. And, or you may not consider responding to the need call. Um, also, there's a consent agreement that we issue, that we send together with our NITPO letter. If you sign that consent agreement, you, by signing that consent agreement, that means that you agree with the, your disqualification. So the disqualification process ends here. Okay, next online question, please. Who should a sponsor or sponsor investigator contact for questions regarding IND requirements of a clinical study? Uh, in our review division, I think Kevin talked yesterday about um, uh, that at the pre-IND level, they can uh, uh, communicate with the uh, OND division and the project managers, um, and I think uh, Judith also talk, talked about that, I, I'm, I'm assuming. Uh, so, uh, Contact the OND review divisions for your questions. Got another one back there? All right, give me another one. Other than the clinical investigator IND guidance for IN, it says INV, INV initiated trials under IND and the associated regulations, are there any other guidances specifically for AMCs? For? AMCs. What's the name? Yeah, we are waiting on clarification for AMC. <laughs> this is the joy of online questions. You used a, uh, the person online, we don't know what an AMC is. So if you could let us know that. Do we have any other questions in the meantime? Academic Medical Center. Ah. Oh, so can you now repeat the question? <laughs> <laughs> repeat the question okay. now that we other than the clinical investigator IND guidance for investigator-initiated trials under IND and the associated regulations, are there any other guidances specifically for academic medical centers? Oh, for uh, specifically for academic medical centers, I'm not. Sh I don't think we have a specific one for academic medical centers, but I can always look and ask. If you can, you can. Me, but I don't think we have a specific guidance for. No, yeah, thank you. So my <laughs> colleague said no already. All right, let's take one more question, and then I know you have a slide that you want to share some final tips. But let's uh, go ahead and take one more question from online, please. Does the EIR state the classification NAI, VAI, or OAI? Oh, does it state the classification? Um, usually EIR uh, doesn't include, uh, well, there is a paragraph in the EIR that talks about the classification. However, but no, okay, so my colleague who is going to give the next talk um, and who writes the EIR actually told me that they don't have a statement about that. But you will know about the classification from the type of letter or correspondence that you receive. So that's your 
knowledge about the threat of classification. Okay, let's go on to your last slide to wrap up. Okay, so in summary, I think these are the key elements. Try to write a complete and articulated protocol and select qualified uh, team members, train your staff, and adhere to the protocol, supervise or be there personally, communicate, have frequent meetings, anticipate uh, problems that could happen, and act promptly on your uh, on the issues that you can find, and then reevaluate after you implement your corrective action. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, we are going to go into our lunch break. Thank you so much. And